Between heaven and earth, the cross opened a door, veil of the temple torn with power that shook the floor, removed the separation between God and man, made the temple more simple and a revolution in the church began. His temple now built of his children, called them living stones, his presence in the heart of the forgiven, never again alone. When Jesus left, he said it was for our best. His journey had ended and the spirit would do the rest. He would lead us into healing and transformation, give us gifts and God's heart for the nations. He shows us all truth and is our guide, a wonderful counselor who speaks on the inside, reveals to us the true father, shows us our places, cherished sons and daughters. It's hard to accept after a life of rejection, but a dad's love is here that doesn't require perfection. Resets my mind's perceptions, undoes my heart's deceptions if I let him in. The best friend I've ever known loves me perfectly, I'll never be alone. Gentle as a dove, precise as a surgeon, his presence inside of me always working. Up, up and away, lifts my spirit out of shame, crushes the cage I was trapped in for days, unlocks my heart so I can be fully me. My armor falls off, I can breathe, makes me clean. Everything I've done, forgiven. Born again, new chance at living. There's hope for change, no longer locked up or just stuck the same. Makes me more than just a man. Once knocked over by temptation, now got the strength to stand. Puts his sword in my hand. I got a warrior on my side. He dominates demons and pulverizes my pride. Fights against the darkness and turns the tide. Removes my guilt, no longer needs to hide. Heart was a desert, now living water on the inside. Fills all the cracks in my soul and makes me complete. Tender as a child, but stronger than concrete. Takes every defeat and somehow makes it a victory. Reveals his presence in every part of my history. Rewrites my story with hope, a mystery. When his spirit first fell, everyone spoke in new tongues. Different nations understood it, a sign of things to come. All those nations will be gathered again soon. But this time, in a heavenly throne room. Dressed in white robes, palm branches in their hands, joining the host of heaven, worshiping the Lamb. Salvation belongs to our God, will be their praise in the most beautiful song that's ever been played. Every tear wiped away, no hunger or thirst. The first will be last and the last will be first. King Jesus on a horse with a sword at his side, the brightest white you've ever seen. Fire in his eyes, don't be surprised. He's coming for his bride. She'll hear his call and come running. He came once as a baby, but this time it'll be stunning. He'll crush the enemy and be revealed in all his glory. The final chapter complete, but by no means the end of the story. This is his story. God's doing a work of renewal and restoration, even when we don't see it, even when we don't understand it, even when all we see is the mess and the brokenness. But God's promises are true and they're sure. Welcome to OCC, a really community church. My name is Michael Bells. I'm pastor here and I'm so glad that you've connected with us today so we can explore together what God is doing in us and in his kingdom. As our opening video said, I, I, I trust that you pray. And even if you feel like you're stuck in captivity, that you will be set free. As we enter into this time together, I invite you to respond with the bold print. Return to the Lord your God, for God is gracious. Confess to the Lord your God, for God is merciful. 
Repent to the Lord your God, for God is slow to anger. Praise the Lord your God, for God abounds in steadfast love. Worship the Lord your God. Together, let us worship God. I invite you to uh, join together with us in singing this prayer.
But let me highlight two or three things that are happening at uh, o o OCC. Uh, Operation Christmas Child is, is, is coming up. And the mission of Operation Christmas Child, or that, that shoebox thingy, is to demonstrate God's love in intangible ways to, to children in need around the world. And through these shoeboxes, we partner with local churches worldwide to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to make disciples of all the nations. Uh, last year, more than 9.1 million Operation Christmas Child shoebox shoe gifts were collected and distributed. Uh, pick up a shoebox and a packing list, or, or go online and and pack a box that way. Watch this, uh, the video um, that describes uh, one, one child's reaction to receiving the shoebox. This one is for you from Jesus. Jesus loves you, my friend. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much. I received these gloves that I really love. It's my favorite color. <laughs> yes. And I received this awesome mask that I'm gonna scare my little sister and brother in the night with. <laughs> yes, and this pants, and I'm gonna use them in every book I have for school. And these awesome socks. And yeah, I just love it. I'm very grateful! I'm very excited! This is my favorite thing! It makes me feel like Jesus loves me, yes! <laughs> it's like, it brings this feeling to my heart that there's somebody out there that wants to share God's word and even though we feel lost that God is not there, that yes, God exists and he hears our prayers. <laughs> Thank you. Another thing that's happening at OCC is CAP Money Course. Um, it's a simple money management course that gives people the opportunity to learn skills that have a lasting impact on their finances. And so CAP Money teaches how to build a budget, how to make it balanced, how to put a simple system in place to manage and track finances. And it'll help anyone gain uh, more control or more understanding of their finances. So sign up, it begins this Wednesday at seven o'clock and runs for three Wednesday evenings in a row. During the season of COVID, it has really amplified grief and many bereaved uh, folks have, have felt isolation and shame and, and alone as they process their, their losses. And Christmas is a difficult reminder of that grief. And so surviving the holidays is a, is a two hour session, some video and some discussion that offers hope for the hurting. And so we're offering that here at OCC uh, on the 30th of November at between 1 and 3 p.m. John Blythe, who's a, a chaplain, is leading this session. And if you're working through grief or you know someone who is, uh, plan on being part of this. You can sign up or, or register online. An important part of what we're called to do is, is pray. And we'll talk more about that in the message this morning. But join us online tonight between 6.30 and 7.30 as we pray together for one another, for OCC, and for the world. We, as a church, are in relationship with the FR people. So watch and listen and, and join in this prayer for the FR. My name is Paulus Tedessa, I'm from Ethiopia, and today we will be praying for Afar people. Father, we pray that you'd reach every two and a half million Afars in Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Djibouti. Father, we pray in Jesus Christ's name for the house and livelihood of Afar. Father, we pray that you'd multiply their livestock and they would get to know you as an abundant giver, and that would lead them to salvation. Father, we pray that many ways would be available to reach them. We thank you for the Bible that is fully translated in a foreign language. And Father, we also pray that the Afar people will be able to give their full audio of your word, Father. We pray that the Afar people will be enlightened by your word, touched by your word, that you would be speaking to them in visions and dreams that they would recognize you are the true God that they've been seeking. That they would know Al-Masisa is not only a prophet, 
not only a messenger sent from God, but he himself is God. Father, I pray that they would take off the bondage of any ritual activities, anything that is shadowing what the cross means from their religion, from their views, from their culture. Father, we pray that many new believers as the time of Acts will be added every day. We pray that new believers take the gospel around their relatives and areas and would reject all what the world would offer for them not to be a Christian and will be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that many grace, many boldness, many faith will be added to new believers of our people so that they can reach out to more people and preach the gospel. Father, we pray for the salvation of different family heads and of our and sultans and different teachers that will lead the people to salvation by teaching them your word. Father, I pray that they would be evangelisms made out of the house leaders and sultans to preach the gospel to the enriched groups of their own people, Father. Father, we pray that the Afar people will get to know your love and share with other Afar people with boldness. Father, we pray that your tangible hand, which does miracles, which changes lives, happen in Afar every day that they get to know who you are. Father, I pray that there would be many encounters like Paul in Damascus. So, Father, we pray more Afar people would know you and live for you. Call and shout your name, Jesus. And Father, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Lord God, as we read your word, we're so aware of our ties to the biblical world. We regret that so little has changed in our public life since the, the times of the Old Testament. There's still intrigue in high places. There's still unholy alliances. There's still the dynamic of the fearful trying to do away with, or at least get, their own, get out of the way, uh, perceived enemies or threats to their power. There's still the problem of evil in the guise of good. There's still deceit used to gain selfish ends. So it will be. And yet we ask your aid as we go about building our lives, OCC, our city, our world in this age. May we not be disillusioned because of the deceit of people's hearts. May we not lose faith in people because of the faithlessness of the few. May we not fail to see this is your wonderful world or be dispirited. May we not lose a faithful and expectant spirit which is expectant for good expectant for hope, expectant for triumph, expectant for you. May we not lose hope in the ultimate triumph of your good over evil. And as in Nehemiah's day, may we not forget to make days of feasting and thanksgiving, of gladness and giving you thanks for your goodness to us. Be with us, Lord. You are the one who turns sorrow into gladness, weakness into strength, defeat into triumph. Give us fully alive spirits. And we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In light of everything that's going on in the world and all that we've experienced over the last year and a half, we're going to be looking at the book of Nehemiah and how God rebuilds a broken world, a broken culture.
Nehemiah, Nehemiah took on the task of rebuilding his broken world. And unless you've been hiding under a rock, you know that our culture today, our world today is broken. It's shattered. It's messed up. You know it and I know it. So how do we rebuild? We can't stand by passively and do nothing because we still live here. We still have children to raise and grandchildren and generations to come if the Lord tarries. We have no idea when Jesus will return. So we can't use that as a cop out and say, who cares? So what kind of world are we building? And so Nehemiah is going to give us some directions, some instructions, some guidelines about starting to rebuild a broken world, a broken culture. Now, let's understand a bit of the background of Nehemiah. So we've got to go back a little bit. God's people, Israel, had disobeyed. And God, as part of their discipline, allowed Babylon to come in around 586 BC and destroy Jerusalem and take many of the Jews into captivity back in Babylon. After a period of time, God allowed Babylon to be defeated by the uh, Medo-Persian Empire. And so now Jews that had been in Babylon were now in Persia because of the defeat of Babylon. But after a time, the, the leader of Persia allowed the Jews, or, or many of the Jews, to go back and resettle in Jerusalem. There were, there were a couple of waves of, of settlers returning, first under Zerubbabel, and then secondly under Ezra. And you can read about that in the, in the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra is a great partner to, to understanding the book of Nehemiah. In fact, in, in the original Hebrew, it was originally one book, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and then it got split into two. So there have been a couple of different groups who have gone back to, to try to set things right in the destroyed city of Jerusalem that was the capital of God's people. And the book of Nehemiah opens up with Nehemiah's brother coming to, to, ne to visit Nehemiah in Persia. See, Nehemiah is not one of those who has gone back in either that first or second wave. So let's look at the text. It says in verse 1, The words of Nehemiah, son of Halakalah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Let me do a quick side note here. Haniah, who's mentioned in verse 2, was the Jewish emperor or Jewish governor of the Jewish people in Jerusalem. Uh, in Egypt, uh, a little over 100 years ago, there were some, some farmers who were digging a well, and they came across this large collection of ancient scrolls. And, uh, they began to dig them out, and they got called some archaeologists in, and it turned out these ancient scrolls were from an old Jewish community in Egypt around the time of Nehemiah. And as they examine the scrolls, this name Hanani shows up, as well as several other names from the book of Nehemiah. You see, one of the reasons I, I believe in the reliability of Scripture is that our Bible is not just a book of religious truths that could be from anywhere at any time long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. No, these are literally hundreds of archaeological finds, artifacts, inscriptions, documents that mention the people that we read about in the Bible. And Hanani happens to be one of those folks. So we're reading actual history. In verse 3, Nehemiah gets, the, gets the, the terrible news. They said to me, those who have survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, what was Nehemiah's reaction to hearing this terrible news of the plight of his fellow Jews? Well, we read in verse 4, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept for many days. I mourned, and I fasted, and I prayed before the God of heaven. Now, now, in some ways, Nehemiah's reaction is unexpected. You see, while his fellow Jews were suffering in Jerusalem, Nehemiah personally was doing really well. If you read the, the very last phrase at the end of chapter 1, it, it's there almost as an afterthought. Um, and it says, it's sort of a, a by-the-way type statement. But it's an important statement because it has an influence on everything else that happens in the book. Nehemiah says in verse 11, Now I was a cupbearer to the king. 
That was his job description. I was a cupbearer to the king. Now, you need to understand that being a cupbearer to the king was more than a food taster or a waiter. Yes, it included making sure nobody was poisoning the king. He, he drank from the cup first, and as there was poison in it, he was the one who was going to go down. But it was more than that. It was more like being chief of staff. It was a high administrative position. It was a highly trusted position because if you're that close to the king, you were highly trusted and you had some administrative oversight in the palace. You know, we're not talking just about a small guy here. He's got some authority. And we'll see that as this passage unfolds, this whole, this whole book unfolds, there, he is a, a God-fearing man who's working in a secular environment in a high position. He's somebody with, with some influence. And yet Nehemiah's personal success does not blind him or dull him to the pain of his people. And I believe that one of the signs of God working in your life, when, when God gets a hold of you, one of the key signs of that is that even if you're doing well, that's not enough for you. Now, now, during the last 18 months or so, many of us might say about our personal situation, you know, Pastor Mike, I'm, I'm doing okay. I, know, I didn't lose my job. I know lots of people did, but I didn't. I continue to get a salary and we continue to be well. Um, my family is actually more connected than it's ever been. And while I've heard of people dying, no one in my immediate family or my, my closest friends died. We're, we're doing well. But not everyone is. And one of the signs of God's work and God's grace in your life is that it's not enough for you. It's not enough for you. If God has a hold of your life, it's not enough that you can say, you know, personally, I'm well off financially. I'm, I'm doing okay. My, my health is okay. My family is okay. When people have been grabbed by the grace of God, they reach back and help someone else. And Nehemiah is simply following the line of so many folks that we read about in Scripture, that when God gets a hold of us by his grace, we reach back and help others. We see that with Moses. In the book of Hebrews, uh, it says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And Moses could easily say, hey, I'm the adopted grandson of Pharaoh. I'm doing really well. No, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He disregarded disgrace for the sake of God of, of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking forward to a greater reward. And of course, the, the great example of someone who was doing really well and, and choosing to help others, to reach back to help others, is our, is our Lord. We read in 2 Corinthians 8, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, though he had absolutely everything, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Yeah, that's, here's the difference between the way our world thinks and the way a person who has been seized, who has been grabbed hold of by Jesus thinks. The world says, hey, I'm doing okay. I'm doing fine. My, my, my finances is good. My family's is good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in good shape. Everything's okay with me. But a person who's been grabbed hold of by Jesus says, that's not good enough for me. I'm going to reach back because we know that God is the one who's given us our influence. God's the one who's given us our money. God's the one who's given us all that we have. And it's not just for us alone so that we might bless others. Let's make this personal. What, what, are, what are you doing? What are you doing with what God has given you? God's blessed you. He's blessed every one of us. What are we doing? Are we reaching back to help? Sometimes it's giving money, and, and that's great. I'm so thankful for those who faithfully give to OCC. But what about extra money? Does that just sort of go into my account, and I get to buy more and more and fill my closet and buy some more toys and get this and that? And it's not just our money. It's our time, our energy, our resources. What's God want to do with all that? Now, it's very important to note that when Nehemiah starts to think about this rebuilding process. When he hears the news of, of Jerusalem's plight, it says, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept for many days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah begins his approach to Jerusalem, his, his consideration of the plight of his fellow Jews with prayer. We don't read, when, when I heard the news of the walls being broken down in Jerusalem, what I did first was, was get a team of engineers and some architects and some builders, and we researched the best practices of rebuilding city walls, and then we executed the plan. Nehemiah didn't say, I got the best minds together to process and to analyze. 
No, he started with listening. And listening is not what we do well. You know, we, we hear bad news. Maybe we hear a friend has some kind of weird cancer. And what's the first thing? What's our, what's our first step? We, we go online. We read everything we can about that. We, we check out what the Mayo Clinic says and John Hopkins and Dr. Google. And we get on the phone and call some of our medical friends. And we get recommendations on the very best oncologists in that particular area. And we hook our friend up with that. And no, none of that's wrong. But that's not the first thing a Christian does. That's the first thing our world does. But that's not the first thing that followers of Jesus do. Or we go through some, some financial hardship. Uh, maybe somebody in the family loses their job. What's the first thing we do? The first thing is, is not to sit down and, and put a financial plan to get to, together, determine where to cut back, how we can move money around, what we can sell. You may need to do that. You know, getting counsel is, is, is good. Putting a plan together is good. Taking the cap money course is good. But that's not the first thing a Christian does. The first thing that anyone who knows Jesus does is what Nehemiah did in verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept for many days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. There's no greater lesson we can learn about rebuilding our lives than when we start by turning to God. That's where we start. We turn to God. Some terrible thing has happened to one of your children or grandchildren. First thing is we bring it to God. Terrible things happen in, in, in your relationships, in your marriage. First thing, we bring it to God. Something really hard has happened to you on your job. First thing is we bring it to God. There's a problem in the city of Aurelia. We bring it to God. We've got a problem in our country. We bring it to God. We start with the God of heaven. It's not where we stop, but it's where we start. Listen, and I love that Nehemiah addresses the God of heaven. Because God is not just this little God that you, you stick on the dashboard of your car. He's not just, not just the God of my life, the God of my religion. He's not even just the God over OCC or the God of, of every church in the world. The God that we worship is not just the God of North America or even the God of the whole world. He's the God of heaven who rules over everything. That's who we're turning to. We bring it to the God of heaven. This is all his kingdom. We bring it to the one who said to Abraham in, in Genesis 18, I am the Lord. Is anything too hard for me? In fact, God said exactly the same thing to, to Jeremiah. I am the Lord. Is anything too hard for me? And the answer is nothing. Nothing is too hard for God. And, and maybe you're thinking, you know, this thing I'm going through is so bad. It's so big. It's so hard. I don't know what to do. Bring it to the Lord. Nehemiah lived by that motto. Pray when troubles trouble you trouble you. Pray when troubles trouble you. When you're troubled, don't just obsess about it. Don't just toss and turn in your bed. Pray when troubles trouble you. And so Nehemiah is constantly going to God in prayer. In fact, the book of Nehemiah opens in here in chapter 1 with Nehemiah praying a prayer in Persia to the God of heaven. And in chapter 13, it closes with Nehemiah in Jerusalem praying again to the God of heaven. And in almost every chapter of the book, Nehemiah Praise. He understands that you start and you continue with God. You say, Mike, I, I, I don't really know how to pray. Can you just give me some structure on how to get in touch with the God of heaven? Well, let me, let me make, it, make it really simple in this last part of the message. Use, use an acronym like this, ACTS, A-C-T-S, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. And I know some of you may be thinking, hey, I've moved beyond that way of praying, but stay with me. You know, sometimes going back to the basics is good. And let me run through this really quickly because we're going to see it right here in the text in Nehemiah 1. Nehemiah starts with adoration. Verse 5, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Ne Nehemiah is giving us a little tutorial here on prayer. He says the place you start in prayer is with God. You know, 
often we start with a laundry list of our needs. You know, I need this and I need this and so-and-so needs this. And we, we recite our needs. We obsess about it. And then we get up and from our prayer time and we don't feel any better. We simply feel like we've driven those things deeper into our soul. And we were, we're more obsessed, we're more worried than we were before. And we don't live with any sense of, I've given this to God. Jesus says, don't start with your needs. When his disciples came to him and asked, teach us to pray, what did he say? He says, start with God. Start with our Father in heaven. Hallowed, holy is your name. We start by lifting our eyes up to God. That this, this amazing, this awesome, this wonderful, this amazing God we're talking with. And we discover regarding God that this God is faithful, that he is good. And so we begin by worshiping him. We begin our prayer with adoration because you know how to find God. Adoration and praise is God's address. Psalm uh, 100 verse 4 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Second thing is, is confession. Adoration, then confession. Ver verse 6, Nehemiah says, I confess the sins. We Israelites, including myself, and my father's family have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, the decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Now, when you confess, you know, some, some people confess badly. They simply make blanket confessions. It's got like, God, just forgive everything. Just, we just throw it all in the big pile, the whole mess. Just forgive it all, the blood of Jesus over the whole mess. But that's not the way you confess. You confess specifically, not generally. Specifically, Lord, I confess my, my anger. Teach me to be patient. My, my lack of self-control. Change me, Lord. And maybe, maybe you're thinking, you know, I, I really don't know how to word that, how, how to confess. Here, here's, here's a simple tool. You, you don't have to be brilliantly creative and come up with this stuff all, all on your own. There's a book called the Anglican Book of Common Prayers. Uh, and I, I use it on an occasional basis, probably two or three times a month. And I, I, I use part of it that's called the Great Litany. And you can go online to find it. I'll put, put the link in the, in the service notes. And so if you're watching this online, you'll uh, see that below. Just click on the Great Litany and it leads you through a confession that really helps you walk through that and helps us identify those things. Some things that need to be confessed that sometimes we ignore. So adoration, confession, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is really simple. The heart of thanksgiving is simply cultivating a good memory, remembering what God has done for you. You remember God's goodness in your life. You remember God's promises. That's what Nehemiah does in verse 10. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Thanksgiving simply recognizes that all the good things in my life don't have to be there. They are there by grace. Do you know there's nothing in your life that has to be? Nothing. If you're sitting here and you're not in pain, that's the grace of God. And we respond, thank you, God. You ate today. You know, there's other people in the world who haven't had something to eat yet. It doesn't have, it doesn't have to be what you eat, but it's simply the fact that you have eaten. That's the grace of God. Is there anyone in the world who cares about you? That's the grace of God. It doesn't have to be. Again, thanksgiving is not a hard thing. And a lot of people have found that a helpful practice in offering God thanksgiving is to write out your thanks. Take your journal or just a scrap people a piece of paper and write what you're thankful for. Psalmist said in Psalm 116 verse 17, I offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. One sacrifice is it takes time to write the things I'm thankful for, and I, I, I give that to God. Maybe it's a sacrifice for you simply to set aside some time to be thankful, to some, some time to read his words, some time to pray. Make that sacrifice. So adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then we get to supplication. That's simply a fancy word which means making your, your request known to God. You, you have something really big? There's nothing too big that God can't handle. And there's nothing too insignificant that God doesn't notice. And so as we finish up, we read verse 11. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man, re referring to the king. 
Brothers and sisters, it's time. It's time to rebuild some broken walls. It's time to rebuild broken dreams. It's time to renew what God wants to do. It's time to renew OCC. It's time to renew ministry around the world, ministry across our city and our province and our country. And it starts with prayer. There's a mystery to prayer, to talking with, not simply talking to, but talking with. But there's also power in prayer. And through prayer, we, we draw near to God. And we are changed. We're transformed through prayer. And our prayers have an impact. Sometimes we don't see that. Sometimes we see that impact. Sometimes we don't. We need a work of God. God working in and through his people. That, that's you and I. To heal our land. To heal our, our, our racial and our cultural and our class and our political and our community divides. We need God to work in such a way that he brings together in such a way that, that he can invade it because the stage has been set. In the midst of all of the brokenness, in the midst of all of the mess. And maybe, maybe that's what you need right now in your life, in your home, in your career, but we also need it for our city and for our land. If we're going to see God at work in our world, we've got to see God's heart. We've got to get God's heart, God's burden. We've got to go to God based on his ways. We've got to be willing to use our whatever positions of influence we have for improvement in the lives of others. We've got to keep our eyes open for when God makes that moment happen. Are there ways that God wants to use us to contribute to the healing of our, of our land, of our city, of our friends, of our own lives? Keep your eyes open for a God moment. Keep your eyes open for those God moments. Because if you just go along, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, nothing's ever going to happen. God has invaded history. God is still working within history. But he does it in his own time and in his own way. And when we're walking with his purposes and walking in his pathways, there'll be some exciting lessons and some exciting growth points in our lives as we offer hope and meaning and life in the name of Jesus to this world.
it's one thing to uh, agree with the text and agree with the philosophy and agree with the approaches and say, yes, prayer is essential and yes, we should get connected and we need to encourage one another. It's another thing to actually live that out and to do that. And so let me encourage you, um, get connected with us tonight, 6.30 to 7.30 to pray. And we're going to follow the ACTS acronym tonight. We'll, we're going to walk through that and pray in that manner this evening. And the other thing is, let me encourage you to get connected to a life group. Right now, we've got three that we're preparing, uh, one on Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, one Thursday night at 7, 7 o'clock, and one Thursday afternoon that's going to be live um, in, in person, meeting uh, around a table here at OCC in, in Theater One. Um, if those times and those dates don't work for you, let us know, and we'll see what we can do in terms of finding another time. or, or Gather some folks here yourself. Um, the resources are all going to be on the website, so uh, go to the sermon link uh, under under resources, and you'll find uh, the, the the questions, the discussion type questions, and other things that you can use to dig deeper into uh, this rebuilding, this renewal time, and see what God is going to do as we rebuild, renew, restore the broken walls of life. Go now from this time and place of worship to the ministry of God's people near and far, refreshed by the living water that Jesus offers you. Listen for the parched voices of the least of these. Search out the dry places and the arid soils. Become for them a spring of living water. And as you go, may the blessings of the God of life, the Christ of love, and the Spirit of grace be upon you this day and forevermore. Amen.